I'll go, good afternoon. <laughs> Hi. My name is Sarah Billingsley, and I am the Marketing Communications Director at the College of Continuing Education at Sacramento State. And I'm here really just to introduce our panelists today, which is Dr. Jenny Murphy, who is the Associate Dean of the College of Continuing Education at Sac State, and Guy Felder, who is the Chief Strategist from Story and Structure. And we'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. So the College of Continuing Education, or CCE, is one of eight colleges at Sacramento State. And as a self-supporting college, we, ha we offer uh, certificates, courses, seminars, workshops, and conferences, and we've been doing that since 1951. So we're celebrating our 65th anniversary this year. Yay! Yay. <laughs> and CCE serves the needs of diverse audiences. As, do people know CCE? Have you all taken, some of you have taken oh, courses yay. through CCE? Good. Yes, cool. cool. So um, academic, professional development, international programs, conferences, and custom training services. We serve nearly 31,000 students and participants a year at CCE. Um, and Jenny likes to say that CCE works at the intersection of higher education, workforce development, and economic development. And we go beyond the borders of a traditional education and offer additional pathways to education and training. So Story and Structure is a consulting firm that practices human-centered design. And Guy will tell you more about the philosophy of Story and Structure, but what they say on their website is, we look for solutions that are desirable, viable, and feasible. Desirable for a human perspective, viable for a um, business perspective, and feasible from a technology workflow perspective. And the most significant and long-ranging opportunities exist at, in the intersection of these areas. So leading from the human perspective offers the best way to understand how our organization is experienced by your customers. So Jenny and Guy are here to present a session called I Have a Hammer Who Has a Nail. And the idea for this session stems from a problem that we face at CCE and at Sacramento State and really the California State University system as a whole. And we think that it may sound uh, familiar to some of you. And it's related to the tendency that we have to identify a problem or problems in like one area of our organization. And then since we're problem solvers, we turn outward and try to go find a solution somewhere. And in this particular case, CCE is pretty desperately in need of a CRM. So we have at least seven, at least seven databases at just CCE, just in our college, and none of them speak to each other. So um, there are legacy systems, and as they become more antiquated, we uh, have this tendency to think that a new tool, a shiny new tool, is going to solve all of our problems. So the case study that Jenny will share is about our journey towards a CRM. And actually, it's really more of a work in progress. We have started down the path several times, um, all in the same general direction. <laughs> but over the past year, we've made a, a conscious decision that it's time to turn inward first and to really assess the people, process, and technology that are involved and determine a shared understanding of the the actual problem, and then make meaningful strategic organizational decisions. So then Guy will talk about how approaching those questions with a human-centered perspective will help us understand our organization and how it's experienced by our constituents. So how is it experienced by our students, by our stakeholders, by our partners? And this will help us make the organizational decisions that are not only effective and efficient, but ultimately align beautifully with our mission and our purpose. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jenny and Guy. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And thanks, everyone, for being here, uh, especially towards the end of the day. You sort of think people are going to wane off. But uh, yeah, keep those drink tickets handy, because I think the reception is shortly after us. OK, so um, the session objectives really 
are, they circle a couple things. And, and I think the first two are very sort of like, okay, no kidding, like no duh, of course. Um, you need to have um, a shared understanding of your need before you buy a technology system or invest in one. And that you shouldn't let that technology tool prescribe or drive the way you run your organization. So I know that seems like no duh, but um, that's not really the way it has been, uh, the conversations have gone in our organization. And then the third one, um, just really looking at human-centered design as something that resonates very, um, very true to me in my head and in my heart, um, having come up um, through education as a corporate trainer and then moving into academia, um, I always approach training and development and programs from how is the student gonna be different after this course? How will the participant be different because we've done this program? What will the organization look like when people have received this training or development? So it makes sense to me that when we're going to do a change or we're gonna invest in technology, we should ask those same questions. But alas, what you know and what you love is not always what happens in your organization. So I'm gonna take you on a little journey through our history. Um, unfortunately, Sarah, the history goes much longer uh, than just a year or two, and uh, she doesn't know this because she wasn't here. We hired her in to help us move forward, and this is one of the projects she inherited. So I'm gonna take you back to the spring of uh, 2012 and just kind of give you a little bit of our environmental landscape. So for those of you, well, all of you probably remember a little economic downturn in 2008 and 9 and 10. Uh, in our particular college, we had a reduction in workforce of about 25%, um, not unlike a lot of our um, other uh, governmental partners and folks in public service. Um, we also had a new dean at that time. So he was coming in right after kind of the downturn and things were starting to look like they were gonna spike up. He came from a, a, a private university, uh, I was very used to um, a lot of funding coming in, a lot of tools and resources, not from uh, a public higher education sector. And it was also an institution that was in the Bay Area, so a very different climate and very different um, operating way. Um, we had some major critical vacancies in our, in our college. So we didn't have a director of technology, we didn't have a director of extension programs, we didn't have a director of academic programs or an associate dean. So really in our little college that serves 28 to 31,000 a year, it's sort of like we were missing a chief deputy director and a couple deputies across our major product lines. Now we had crazy, amazing staff to do a lot of the work, um, but we didn't have all the folks at the right level to make the promises, uh, to have the authority to make decisions, and to actually really drive us forward. And of course, we were all still a little bit nervous about expanding because we'd been through the downturn, and we didn't want to hire up because we didn't want to reduce again and, and go through all those things. So there was part of that psychological stuff going on in our organization. Um, the other thing is that we had our new dean brought some new aggressive growth goals. So $1 million a year, that was one of the just targets that was Put out there. Um, when our non-credit classes are priced at uh, maybe $200 for a class or um, it's a couple thousand dollars to get started on one class in a degree program, uh, a one million, that, that's a lot <laughs> of new people to bring in, a lot of new programs to develop um, and move forward. And then it was a time in education where um, data-driven decision-making was starting, like these words started getting used in higher education in a way that I don't know that I'd ever even actually heard them used before uh, in higher education, but that started kind of nationally and we're hearing it. And then performance measures like, oh my gosh, you're actually, we're actually accountable to make sure people graduate, not just let them in. But this was part of access in California, getting folks in. Um, but then now we need to get them out. And then certainly in academia, it's not traditional, at least in uh, public higher education. And most of the history of higher ed, it's not about whether students get a job or get employed. We have provided education you're on your own, go forth and prosper. So now the conversations you know, are, are looking like, huh, we have to do a little more. So that was the bigger landscape. So then uh, fast forward a year, and it's now January 2013, and our new dean had kind of gotten the lay of the land, and he was like, we're getting a CRM. We're just gonna pick a system, it's gonna fix all our problems, I can't get reports, I don't know what we need. Um, let's call some vendors. 
And I love the dangerous thing when a boss goes out, and I know I do this too, goes out to a conference and talks to five vendors, and then next thing you know, they're coming to your organization, and you're inviting everyone to a demo. So um, we did this, and, um, and I, I get it from um, my dean's perspective at the time. He's very much a, a intuitive type learner, so he wanted to see systems, learn systems, hear the conversations. Um, it's, it, from a research perspective, it's really called grounded theory. That's really his approach. But um, what I saw in the organization was our employees go, oh my gosh, we're getting a new system. Oh, this is going to change my job. I'm going to lose my job. When are we doing this? Does he know our systems don't talk? <laughs> I saw all of that going on. Um, and I was really on the, let's just assess where we're at. Let's check our readiness to do this. You know, let's look at our people. Let's look at our, tech, our current technologies. Because I wasn't really convinced that we didn't actually already have some of these tools in place uh, amongst our seven <laughs> databases at the time. Um, and then we also really needed to look what was our current staff knowledge around doing this type of work. So, <clears throat> yeah, my boss and I really did get along, but we disagreed on a few things, and maybe that sounds familiar to anyone in the room where you're not quite on the same page. Um, I really stuck to my guns about what I thought customer relationship was, which is a philosophy first and a technology second. And it's a bias I have, um, and I will honestly uh, say that it probably came from my college days, I worked as a waitress and a bartender uh, for a restaurant group to pay for school, and I knew that our, our um, service statement for customer service was fun, friendly service in a friendly and warm environment. So there's these statements that for me are about um, what's your philosophy, how you do things, and then the tactical stuff will just get done. So my boss and I compromised because I actually controlled the finances. So that's why we compromised. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, because that's the way it works sometimes, right? You gotta find, you gotta leverage your strengths and your assets. So we brought in an independent consultant and um, she did, oh my gosh, she moved mountains inside of our organization uh, to get some, to some data. And I know that's not, um, it's not really the details on this slide, but we all know these are the kinds of reports and tools you get back when you bring in an expert or a consultant, and here's the timelines, and here's what they did. But she looked um, very thoroughly at our organization. She looked at um, different artifacts we had, uh, wanted to look at system maps for our technologies and our databases, and so some of the answers came back with, oh, well, we don't have those. So. Um, some got built and then handed to her. Uh, we did surveys, she met with groups, we had confidential interviews and, and rolled it all up. And uh, by now, a year later, it's January, and this is like, oh my God, uh, you asked for it, here's what we found out. Uh, we had 11 different databases with student and client information in addition to Excel spreadsheets. We like to customize what we do and we like to empower our employees to get their work done the way they like to. Um, we did have CRM, customer relationship management um, capabilities, in some of our existing student record systems. Um, these databases that we had, we had customized the heck out of them such that we were not using the upgrades from the vendor. So we found out like, oh, three years worth of upgrades. <laughs> we actually can't do, because we have to go back and customize the heck out of these things to do what we're doing. So this brought into question all of our processes. What do we do? How do we do this? And a little bit, um, more paralysis by analysis than what we already had. Um, we definitely also found that um, we were lacking trust amongst our organizational departments. So everybody in their units trusted everybody else with their data, but they did not trust somebody else with the data. What are you gonna do with my student information? What are you gonna, are you gonna market to them? They're already in my program. So um, I don't think that, was a, that part was a surprise, but it was definitely a confirmation of reality. Um, one of the other things we found out, we did not have role clarity in our organization who does what from the time a student contacts us until they become an alumni, like where's the cutoff or even like where's the gray space? We couldn't even agree that there's some messy point in between here and here. Well, I wasn't even looking for a solid line. We just couldn't even agree where that was. And then um, we really lacked critical vocabulary around this. So things like lead generation, a soft handoff, re even the term recruitment, what that meant inside of our organization, uh, critical transactions. Um, we, we just didn't have a shared vocabulary around that. So we go forward a little more. Another year goes by as so we wrestle with this stuff. 
Um, by January 2014, our enrollment is continuing to grow. That one million a year is actually ramping up to almost two million a year because the economy is picking up. We're building more programs. Um, we still had a lot of leadership vacancies. Four out of our seven leadership positions were vacant. We actually had never had an IT director inside of our college. We certainly um, benefit from the IT infrastructure of the university, but we're a self-support. No, no state funds go to us, so we're always last on the, on the list, and rightfully so. Um, but that left us with a lot of technicians and not leadership in this capacity, which makes um, fixing these 11 databases even more of a challenge and getting a new system and implementing CRM even more of a challenge because you have people like me with no IT background trying to implement <laughs> or assess a technology system. Um, we had, a lot of, we had a lot of turnover. Um, I think we actually got you hired that year. We got a marketing director hired that year, and that was like a big win for me, cause also because she's still here, and she's great. <laughs> um, and then we did this fabulous thing. Let's create a CRM task force. So this is beautiful in a team approach style, but it's also called let's just spread the work out because no one person has time to do all this, and that's exactly what happened. Um, we did have one of our um, units come forward and really want to do a pilot. This was our non-credit certificate program unit and we sort of thought yeah that's good that's actually a safer space to play in non-credit a um, little shorter cycle but we went <laughs> you know we we met our, our task force uh, met but again we were just spreading the work we weren't focused about what we were doing or how we were getting there so by uh, the beginning of 2015 still no CRM Womp, womp, womp. Still using spreadsheets, existing databases, arguing over who does what, and saying, I don't know about this thing. I don't think we need it. Um, but enrollment was still growing. We actually got away from the task force and made a core team. Let's get down to the critical people, lose some of the baggage. We got the core team in place. We're going to get this done. Um, the core team actually did an amazing job of actually um, sort of uh, recalibrating a little bit where we were going. They did a listening tour with several of our counterparts in the CSU system. 23 campuses, there were actually only three other campuses that had a CRM uh, in the continuing ed space. So we went out and visited, and visited those. Went we invested in sending about five or six people to a specific CRM conference within the discipline of continuing ed. Um, we tried a small project with Excel spreadsheets and like manually doing everything just to try to figure out our flow and our workflows. Um, at the same time, then we got really extra excited because our system allegedly had identified a CRM vendor and all of a sudden I thought, oh, they're going to have a master agreement. We can just get this. We're mapping some stuff out, but this is going to be easier for us because it, it will be a system that the CSU has blessed. But that didn't go through. Um, and then we got a new president at Sac State and he's awesome and he's exciting and he's ready to go. Um, and we're ready to go, but that makes everyone else nervous when you have a new president and a new boss because everybody's worried about other things than some of the stuff we were originally focused on. So at that point, uh, some of my big things came, uh, uh, you know, just more, I guess, got louder about these. I'm like, we don't even have a definition of customer service. Um, how can we deliver on what customer service is? Um, we don't have our processes documented. How can we do process improvement? How can we make these decisions? Like, we haven't even done the fundamentals. Um, and then project management in our organization. Remember I said we love to empower our people to do things the way they want. So we don't have consistent project management templates or doesn't, everybody knows what a charter is or what's the role of a sponsor. Well, we have vacant leaders, so we actually don't even have any sponsors for you if you have a charter. So this was kind of, um, kind of our world. And um, I don't know, the customer service definition is, is still one of my pain points. So we'll get that solved. So then 2016 begins. It's another new year and bright and shiny. We're ready to go forward. Again, enrollment is continuing to grow. Um, we heard wind of our campus actually identifying a system, not to use it the way we would, but again, it was like, okay, yay, <laughs> there'll be some kind of agreement that we can build on. Um, we also learned that our counterparts across the system that had invested in these other tools were ditching their systems or trying to get out of contracts because they weren't happy with the purchases they made. This is probably the one point in this whole process I can go, yeah, it's good we didn't jump on board. <laughs> it's good we weren't on the bleeding edge because we would be in the same situation they were in. Um, but we had more leadership changes, more staff changes. Um, and so the core team and me, we just really stepped back. We're like, help, <laughs> really big. We need big help. Um, 
So we took a time out. We um, really went back to, we want to do this the right way. We have to address this as an organi organizational change. This is not about a tool. It's not just about processes. Um, it's not just about making the boss happy or doing what everybody else is. We really need to step back and look at organizational change. This is going to have a major shift in our culture, in our organization. So that's when we called a friend. <laughs> Phone a friend. <laughs> yeah, use their phone a friend. Um, well, my name's Guy Felder. Um, let me just blaze you real quick a little bit about me so you know why I'm up here and where I come from. Um, I'm from Houston, Texas, and uh, before joining Story and Structure, I worked for 10 years at a public university called the University of Houston. Um, before that, I built sports arenas. Um, I did um, Van, Andel, Van Andel, Pittsburgh Steelers, Toyota Center in Houston. I was a cost control engineer. And so I worked with municipal governments um, who were funding, municipal and county governments who were funding these through bonds to make sure that we were spending that money appropriately. It was a very exciting job. Um, and, but also amazing to look at a very, that's where I cut my teeth on project management was building sports arenas. And really you build them in circles. Right, and you do. There's radials, and you, they all have numbers. And this group needs to be at three, so this group can start at two, and so on and so forth. Um, at University of Houston, I led marketing and enrollment support. Now, what is marketing and enrollment support? Well, at a public institution, what we're here to do, it's all about access. It's making sure that we're making the case amongst private competitors of why you should consider a public institution. Right. Um, while I was at the University of Houston, I went through my first major system, enterprise level system integration. We moved from a campus wide system that managed our financial management system, HR, and student information systems were swapped out from a homegrown system to an off the shelf system. Now, how did they build the homegrown system? Some IT folks went around and sat down with the people in accounts payable and said, How do you issue vouchers? wrote down the process, went over to some students in the computer science department and said, hey, build us something that'll do this. That's how we built our first system. And then we got PeopleSoft and everybody had to change the way they did their jobs, right? So you know a little bit about me. Let me ask you guys some questions. How many of you have been through one major enterprise system in implementation? Two, <laughs> three, four, Enterprise level system implementations are like weddings. You don't do them a lot, and most it's not part of our day-to-day our -day jobs, but we're kind of thought that we're going to be really good at them, right? Like, oh, we, we need a wedding. Let's go get these people that I'm, I'm, I'm the, the groomsman. I'll plan the wedding. Well, no, we don't really. It's not something we do a lot of, right? And so what we find a lot of times is that what you hear in, in and in, in what Jenny shared is a lot about this is a big thing and we need to be sure that we do it right. I work with a lot of organizations that, are, that go through and do these implementations. I, am not, I do not work at a technology company. Um, we do not have a technology product. We do not have a technology platform. We help organizations get ready to select technology. And the reason why we do that is a lot of organizations do exactly what Jenny said. They call a bunch of software vendors in, platform vendors, and the, the vendors give them a feature presentation. You make their job so easy when you do this, right? And so what we say is this is called a technology-centered approach. And this is I'm going to buy a tool, and everybody that has to interface with that tool is going to have the processes, how they work, is going to be dictated by this tool. This tool tells me how to do things. I have to flex myself around the tool. So when I used to need a voucher or I needed to complete an HR action or I needed to do any number of things, I needed to file a ticket, I did it this way. But now we have a new tool and I'm going to do it this way, right? The human-centered approach shifts this methodology. And what we do is we say, all right, we kind of go back to that first scenario I described when I worked at the University of Houston, where because there was no tool out there, people just went around and said, how do you do this? I promise, PeopleSoft, some oil company, I think is what PeopleSoft came out of. Somewhere, someone sat down with that oil, you're, if you have PeopleSoft, you are doing HR the way that oil company did it. Because that's how they built it. You're issuing vouchers the way the oil company issued vouchers. 
CRMs are the same way. All these systems, it's, it's, most of them were built as part of an organization. The people that built it left the organization and took it out into the market. So the human-centered approach says, okay, look, right? If you remember that slide at the very beginning with the three things, what's feasible, what's, what's you know, all those other things. The human-centered approach says, just a minute, where are we with technology? Are we still in the DOS days where I have to completely change and bend myself? No. So I'm about to make a technology implementation. What's the first thing I need to know? The features that a software vendor has for me are, are my are tertiary concern, right? The first thing I need to know is what are my people doing? How are they doing their jobs, right? This is that whole idea that, that more and more um, I, um, IT is moving a lot into business process management rather than you know, what network cable needs to be connected over here and what ports need to be open, right? And so it's what are my people doing, right? CCE did not have an understanding of what their people were doing because everybody was doing, doing everything differently. Whenever I hear an organization tell me, oh, well, those people over there are using spreadsheets, I go, okay, so they're using an Excel-based platform that they built themselves. Right? Because that's what it is. They turned Excel into, in, in some ways, I think sometimes we should call Microsoft and be like, could you just pull some features out of this so that people cannot run entire HR departments <laughs> out of Excel? Um, could you make Outlook so that it can't send an email to more, than, to more than five people? Because we have people using Outlook as a communication system, you know, things like that. And so a lot of times what happens is, is that every time I hear those things, I'm like, this is a, this is a group who's taken their processes, and now they're implementing it across their system. When I worked for the University of Houston, um, we reorganized the institution while I was there, and about eight people in senior level positions had to, had to uh, their positions were eliminated. The, that elimination happened in April. Um, the second most visible thing outside of football that happens in Texas universities is commencement, and ours almost didn't happen because we fired the eight people that knew how to do it. Right? Because we had no system that supported commencement. Like someone actually looked at all the grad apps and read them and then had an Excel spreadsheet that they went in and changed things on. Uh, the application of a credential, the biggest thing a university does. So when we take the human-centered approach, what we sit down and do is, is we say, what are my people doing? What processes does this system need to carry out? I document those, and then I call my software vendors, and I say, features are great, but I need you to come to a proof of concept on how your system is going to support what our organization is already doing, right? These are the things, when you come do your demo for me, I need you to show me how your system is going to do this. I need you to show me how you understand our organization, and you're going to move a payment request from the front lines all the way through you know, administration and finance through the appropriate channels. I need to show that you can do business process and workflow support that's, gonna, that's, that's going to take me where I need to go. Now, um, if you're a project management or IT person, you're probably sitting there, you're going, well, everybody's going to come in and they're going to have five million things they want this thing to do. Make me coffee. I want 300 different reports that all look beautiful, right? I want all these things. Human-centered design um, actually deals with this. And it deals with this in the following way, in that we divide, a, we divide a process into two major phases. The divergent phase, where anything is possible. And the convergent phase, where we take everybody's wishes and compare them to the business realities and the feasibility. Right? There are always legal, physical, cost. There are, there are barriers to being able to do anything, right? Human-centered design exists because if you just went to ask people what they want and built it, then no one, it would be really easy, right? Okay, great, you want all these things? Sure, we can do all of that. We're gonna build a system for you, right? But coming in and sitting down with folks and saying, look, right now, we wanna understand if, if, if everything could happen, what would you like? And what you'll start to notice is that themes emerge, right? We look at those themes, whether or not we, we're going to actually add a feature that's going to automate this thing is not, it's not the question we're answering right now. It's what are the themes. And then once we understand the realities of the organization, we can then sit down and go, okay, what are the, basically, 
software vendor, whoever, this developer, whoever's going to create this, I need you to show me I have A to Z up here, everything I want. I have $400,000. How far can we get through this? Can we get to C? Can we get to M? Right? And so then I start to understand my, my, my process is we'll get to Z, but it's going to take five years because we just don't have the resources and the institution, the organization is going, not going to be able to support that much of a dynamic shift. Right? And so we move from the, I've taken, I understand collectively what everyone wants to now I've got now my job, right, as the project leader or as, as, the, as the task force in this case is to now pare this down to what does everybody need, right? What is it, what is it, what are the core functions that the system has to do? Once I understand that, then, only then, do I go to my, to my software folks, my developers, my, my platform providers, and I say, all right, we want demos. Your features are the last thing we wanna hear about. What we wanna hear about before that is we need you to do a proof of concept on how you're going to carry out these functions. We have swim lanes for you. I, I'm, is, imagine what, what your vendor meeting would look like if that were the case. You're not, I, I, I don't care how many reports your thing can do and because, and, you know, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room knows that you can do anything with APIs, but you say API and it's just dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign, right? So if, if the sales engineer shows up, then I would say, no, don't bring your sales engineer, bring him, but also bring a developer who we can sit down and talk to about all these swim lanes and how you're going to support this. Now, if you have a process, if you have ways that you think you can improve this process, great, we want to hear that. But um, what we're most concerned about before we get to features is how you're going to support the process that we have in place. And that's human-centered design. We're asking technology to flex itself around people, not people flex themselves around technology. Right? We, we should be there right now. So really quickly, this is the human-centered design process. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. Um, I think the slides are available. Um, but any organization that, that this is what we take organizations through. Um, the biggest piece here is that we prototype. We build things on small scales. We, we, this, is, this isn't piloting. I hate piloting. Um, we build things on small scales and we test them in a theoretical environment before we deploy. So what did we do with CCE? Well, basically we sat down and we said, you basically as an organization are responsible for doing these things. You have to market, recruit, you have to complete a critical transaction, that means get people to register or apply. You have to provide a classroom experience, whether it's online or in person, and then you have alumni, right? And right now your organization has a tons, of, tons of processes to do all of these things. They're doing it seven, 11, 12, 13 different ways because these processes are being created by people that actually are responsible for a product line or a program instead of the overall organization. And what's happening is, is that the experience that the, that the customer or the student is having varies, right? And so in any organization, if you have a wonderful marketing and you have great customer service, but then you get to the screen where you have to pay for something and it looks wonky, people will wonder what's going on. Um, in Texas, the DMV is phenomenal at this, right? This beautiful website, and then I get to the point where I need to pay my registration, and it, looks, it doesn't look like the site. You don't know what it is. I don't understand where I'm at. And all of a sudden, I get scared, right? Because did someone take over this system, and I'm paying someone in Russia, uh, <laughs> you know? And so basically, what we sat down and what we would say any organization would do is let's do a service blueprint. What happens in each of these buckets in our organization right now, right? What do we want to see happening? Once we understand that, once we have our processes understood, then we can move into technology. Here's actually pictures from when we um, did it. And I have to tell you guys, um, before I turn it back over to, to Jenny, the, the processes in place in, in CCE right now are so divergent um, that we were unable to do a complete mapping because everybody, you, you could have three program groups, three functional groups that are doing pretty much the same thing with different programs, but they're doing it all differently, right? So the first thing that we recommended for CCE was that they go through uh, process improvement. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jenny. 
Okay, so we're getting pretty close to 2017. You've noticed I have a theme every year. We start ambitiously with some plans ahead and every year we're not quite there yet. So uh, I'm looking ahead for January 2017, but we actually have a plan. And uh, with some of the help um, from, from um, Story and Structure through Guy, uh, we've pulled back in, as Sarah said, and we've really focused on a couple of real critical things that we know we can actually get done uh, to move us forward. We have to have a shared vocabulary inside of our organization. This is critical. Um, so we're gonna have to define those things as an organization and work through that process. Um, we are going to have to construct our enrollment funnels. Enrollment funnels are very typical in institutions of higher education, but we've never actually mapped it out and said and put names to it and words to it uh, to, to to put that all together, and we have to do that. Um, and then we have to define the roles within those funnels. Who does what, where do they transition? Um, ultimately, that will probably lead us to the ability to set some performance metrics, like what does this conversion look like, and how many people do we need to um, talk to in order to get this many applications, in order to get this many folks who are qualified for a program? We'll have those kinds of numbers. Um, we know we have to do that work, and I, I will honestly say um, it's amazing the, the great programs that we provide without the solid infrastructure. Uh, we are totally like a homegrown kind of thing that just really grew without all the right tools, but we do amazing things and we really care about the work that we do. Um, so we get things done, uh, we just don't have the names and the tools for it. And it, it's really time to almost recognize, like, it's time to grow up. We cannot be the gangly teenager anymore. That's pretty cool. Like, we need to step into our mature selves as, a, as an institution. Um, so our, our points of clarity with our, with our folks right now is that a CRM system will not fix all of our problems. Now, we do have a new dean, and she's a little bit on the path of, the CRM will solve everything. And we're like, that's okay. You can say that. We know that isn't going to fix everything. So we'll work on managing expectations, but we're on board. We need to get a CRM. Um, that we also need the philosophy around that. Uh, we need to put things in our training manual that say, this is our service philosophy. Um, and I, I kind of chuckle because we do training and development for so many organizations and we do it masterfully, but we don't do it for ourselves. So um, we need to invest in that. Um, we know that the student experience really has to be at the center of all of our decisions. And we do a really good job at that on a day to day and at a program program level, but organizationally, we do get caught up in our rules, our constraints, our sort of administrator brains <laughs> that go, this is the way that it should be, this is the easy way, or this is, this is what the rules will let us buy, um, and we can get pulled away from what's going on with our students and our participants. Um, we definitely know the CRM has to be about organizational change. Um, and so we can continue to study CRMs and all these things as much as we want, but um, I think it's in our best interest to actually look at um, how do we manage change in our organization amidst our university that's changing, amidst how the higher ed is changing <laughs> nationally. So we really need to frame that in perspective. Um, and we need to work with experts for sure. Uh, we need people that know what this looks like when it's successful that can, can shine a mirror up in front of us and let us take a look at ourselves and take a hard critical look. Um, but we also need to do the work ourselves. And I think part of this, when we've been short-staffed, has been like, oh, just get someone in here with a solution, we'll implement it, it'll be fine, our lives will be easier. And the reality is, to go through this change, we have to just find the time and make the time and actually do the hard work ourselves inside the organization. So um, that's the story we wanted to share with you. Um, our reason for sharing this was because um, one of the I used to work in private sector and it was always about being on and always about being shiny and always about having the right answers and always about having the right solution and never letting my clients see that we didn't have our act together. Um, and one of the things I love about being in public higher education and I love about working in government is I swear to God, the best things I learn is when people tell me how they messed up, what didn't work, like, like don't make the same mistakes we did. 
Um, some of them are, you kind of go, yeah, no kidding. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly, because I say that about myself, ourselves here. Um, but if there's anything that you can take away in terms of what we messed up on or don't repeat our mistakes or you've got something going on in your organization and you know this is not going to solve it and you're not sure how to convince your boss, like, hey, it needs to be about this or that, uh, we're happy to come in and tell them our problems <laughs> and tell you what we've messed up on uh, and sort of reinforce that. You have to, you have to do things that that work for your organization. So um, with that, I think we'll take some questions, if you have some. I'm gonna check the microphone. Is there a portable one? Yeah. Five minutes, so we have five minutes for questions. And if you don't ask questions, she will start singing, so. Ah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so it, Okay. okay, good. Um, so it sounds like you guys had a lot of business process challenges, um, and it sounds like you have a lot of different areas doing similar work. So for this next kind of phase that you guys are looking at, are you looking at maybe realigning those areas so that they're not duplicating similar work and not so, um, uh, uh, like, a adverse to each other? Yeah, so um, that is our hope. So first and foremost, one of the things that we want to do, and all are just different, basically, program verticals, um, is get everybody documenting what they're already doing, uh, which seems like obvious, but obviously this is really time consuming to have people sit down and write down what they're doing and, and, and it be truthful and readable. Um, so we wanna get those lined up and what we hope is that when we can then compare um, organizationally, when, we, when everyone can see what everyone else is doing, that this will be like some ahas in the organization and help us with our change efforts to go like, oh, look, we do these things different, but we're all doing this. Could we have some economies of scale or could we have some process improvements that make this happen? We had one of our, actually in going through what I, I call the messy days when Guy was in and the post-it notes and we're like, we can't build a service blueprint, it's too crazy here. Um, we had one unit that has about um, a, a little over 42 staff members. They run over 70 uh, different custom programs a year and, and about 15 different certificate programs. They found out in this session that they don't even do everything the same. So there's already a change effort inside of that unit to, for them to all get on the same page, how they do it. Because it was like, how do we clarify for the rest of the organization what are roles and responsibilities when we even just have these vertical units inside their unit not doing the same. So I think, oh yeah, okay, there's a microphone. Um, we all happen to be with the Department of Corrections. Oh, and, cool. And so, um, we love you guys. We've done a lot of work with you guys over the years. Oh, good. There's no shortage of challenges inside your organization. <laughs> um, but we implemented um, SAP over the last seven to eight years. And um, in addition to um, looking at duplicative activities, um, are you also looking to standardize across the institution, um, you know, we face the challenge of 35 adult institutions and what, six JJs, uh, juvenile justice, um, along with 60,000 employees. So standardizing was really, really critical. Um, I don't know how many blueprinting set, we had 35 alone just on the HR side of the house. Oh, Separate cool. Separate blueprint <laughs> sessions with our, our subject yeah. matter experts. And I know finance and supply chain had very similar experiences. So, um, but I was gonna say in addition to doing away with um, duplicative work, standardization was really critical in our world. Yeah, and I thank you for saying that. I think that some of our hope is that we will be able to standardize some processes, not because we wanna take away the student experience or we wanna take away the autonomy of employees to be very effective at their, cho their job, but we want to have a consistent experience for our students. Um, we want to have actually ease and efficiency <laughs> for our staff, so, so um, yeah, we are are the people that use Outlook as a communication plan. Uh, so, you know, we have set emails that go out to students and it's like copy paste address, copy paste distribution list. But how nice would that be if we had some of this automated so that the first time someone came, you know, called in or came to our website that we had some automated things that went out so that our staff in, in their time they're spending could actually spend more time with students, could spend more time with our faculty and not be doing maybe so much cut cut and paste. Um, the other side of that is, is um, this will be for me a fascinating 
study of ourselves is because standardization inside of education is such a weird thing to approach. And that really comes from, um, we're an academic unit, right? So um, faculty create your content. Faculty own their content. No one is the boss of faculty. No one. <laughs> this is in our ed code in California. So on the staff side, we've pretty much adopted those philosophies as well. We're going to operate and own our processes. Um, and so that'll be the interesting thing is how do we standardize business practices when business is a bad word inside of education? Uh, and, and so I, there's a cultural thing there, but um, I, I'm fascinated to know how many of, I mean, to say the number 35 blueprinting sessions like makes me go, oh, yay, <laughs> like that's good. We can do a lot of these and it will take that to, to get through it. I think that's uh, all the time we have. So thank you all so much for coming. Um, and I think we'll hang around up here if you want to come by. Yeah, thank you. So